Okay. Take it away, Yelena. Are we at time? 3.30. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Yelena Vukomanovic, and I'm very excited to welcome you to the final geospatial forum of the academic year. Uh, as I'm sure most of you know, today is also Earth Day. Uh, so that seems like the ideal opportunity for us to discuss the use of geospatial analytics for exploring the intersection between ecological and human health. Um, I'm so thrilled to welcome today's speaker, Dr. Sarah Gergel. Uh, Dr. Gergel is a professor of landscape ecology and conservation at the University of British Columbia where her research focuses on using remote sensing and spatial analysis to characterize and map ecosystem services uh, and better integrate participatory mapping and local ecological knowledge into landscape analysis. Uh, last year, Sarah was recognized for her contributions to the practice of landscape ecology with the 2020 Distinguished Landscape Practitioner Award uh, given by the North American chapter of the International Association of Landscape Ecology. Whew, it's a long name. <laughs> um, uh, this is one of the association's highest honors um, and is bestowed to those who have uh, made outstanding contributions uh, over a period of many years to the application of the principles of landscape ecology to real world problems. Uh, Sarah has just completed a five-year appointment as the Associate Dean of Diversity and Inclusion for the Faculty of Forestry at UBC. Um, and just following along on Twitter for the last couple of years, um, um, following her office, it's been, I think, truly inspiring to see the events and energy and resources um, that you've made available, um, that you've helped create, um, both you know, for those at UBC and more broadly, everyone who's interacting with social media. Um, I first met Sarah about four, I wanna say four years ago <laughs> uh, at the Landscape Ecology Annual Meeting. Um, and I can attest that she's um, an incredible supporter and mentor to students and early career researchers. Um, and I think it's been um, incredibly valuable to the field of landscape ecology to have scientists of her experience and caliber um, really championing uh, more inclusive and participatory approaches. Uh, I think with uh, maybe it's getting better, but I think uh, it still happens in landscape ecology uh, that the discipline doesn't always consider the relationships between people and landscapes or when they do it's through this lens of humans being external or a threat. Um, so I think it's just incredibly valuable that through her work, um, Sarah is helping to create new spaces and new opportunities for junior scientists who are working um, in human dimensions research. Um, we're not putting our sessions on the last day, the last session of the last day anymore. So I think that's progress. Um, today, um, Sarah will be talking about land cover complexity and food security in tropical forests. Uh, can't wait to hear about this new research. Uh, so please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Sarah Gergel. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And it's wonderful to be here with all of you online. I, I am sad that I couldn't be there in person. I was supposed to visit in person last year and then that got delayed, obviously. And here we are in year two where I can't uh, visit in person. So. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a little sad about that because there's so many people at NC State whose work I uh, appreciate and respect, and I was really looking forward to getting to know more of you in person. So I still hope that uh, will happen someday. And I guess I also wanted to thank all of you that decided to show up here online today. Uh, I, I realized besides just the general unprecedented nature of living and working in a pandemic. Many of us are working from home. We're a little bit more isolated. I have to say uh, it's been uh, quite a roller coaster of a week for uh, anyone who's worried about uh, uh, police brutality and violence to people of color. So the fact that uh, you're here today and you made time for this, I really appreciate it amidst everything else that's going on right now. So I hope I can uh, 
uh, entice you and uh, entertain you for a bit. And I look forward to the social afterwards as well. So uh, what I'd like to talk about today is some of the new areas of research that I've been working on that link landscape diversity to diet diversity. And so it's thinking about how landscapes function in terms of providing nutrition. And let's see. This is ridiculous. It's not forwarding. Let's see. Try arrow down. Yep. Okay. Yeah, for some reason that wasn't working. So um so the, where we want to start with this conversation is to think about hidden hunger. So it's estimated that up to 2 billion people worldwide suffer from hidden hunger. And so this is a little different than a lack of, uh, a lack of calories. So hidden hunger refers to people's diets being deficient in key vitamins and minerals. And so people may certainly be getting enough calories but they're not getting enough nutrition. And some of the uh, micronutrients that are deficient in many people worldwide uh, often include iron or vitamin A, zinc, as well as iodine. And so when, when human diets are lacking these key nutrients, we think about hidden hunger and ways to solve that problem. And many of the nutritionists that uh, I've worked with are increasingly emphasizing the importance of dietary diversity as one way to help solve micronutrient deficiencies. So dietary diversity in the simplest sense is consuming foods from a wide variety of different food groups. And this can go a long way to uh, fixing and supplementing the diversity of human diets. So part of where this idea came from is I was really inspired by the work of Dr. Amy Ikowitz, her 2014 work, where she used uh, survey data. And so household demographic and nutrition survey data in 21 countries in Africa. And she linked the, the diets of children, what children were eating to forest cover in their surrounding landscapes. And so she mapped forest cover using MODIS surrounding various households. And what she found quite compelling pattern that, that, was, uh, that held true for so many countries was that uh, tree cover, the amount of tree cover in the surrounding landscape was positively related to dietary diversity in children. And this, this relationship held for uh, 21 different countries. She's an economist, so she, uh, of course, did a great job of controlling for every other factor you could imagine, like household assets and distance to markets and uh, head of household characteristics and a, and a wide variety of other features. But even after accounting for all these things, tree cover uh, showed a strong positive relationship with diet diversity. And so, this kind of spawned a new area of research trying to figure out why this is. So this is an interesting pattern, but understanding what's driving this and how universal it is, uh, is really a, an open question. And so much of what I'm gonna talk about today is exploring this question as it relates mostly to tropical forests, so tropical forest landscapes, as well as uh, rural households, and primarily in low income countries, as well as low income areas, in middle income countries. So that's kind of the context for uh, where we're gonna explore this, this question. And what I hope to uh, convey to you today is to convince you that forests are an important source, not only of food, but of nutrition. And because we are all, many of us are geospatial scientists here today, I wanna to talk a bit about how our current mapping of forests and landscapes is, is quite limited. It's not giving us the information we need to really address these questions fully. So I hope the geospatial community is sort of a call for us to step up to the plate 
And then I'll end with what I hope are some solutions and synergies as we move forward, you know, a rapidly changing world. So first let's talk a little bit about the evidence that, of how forests support dietary diversity. And some of these are pretty direct and we have a lot of evidence for them. Some are indirect pathways. And then there's some pretty complicated ways that forests support diet diversity that are just beginning to be uncovered and uh, better understood. So the direct contribution of forests to nutrition, that's kind of the, the simplest and straightforward to understand. So that might be uh, collecting uh, fruits or nuts or mushrooms or snails or wildlife. These are some of the direct things that people might collect from the forest that are important to nutrition. And we have a pretty, an imperfect, but pretty good understanding of how forests directly contribute to nutrition through that mechanism. What's also interesting is the role that forests play in supporting livestock, which then have knock-on effects for diet diversity. So there's a, there's a couple different mechanisms at play here. So in some parts of the world, you need livestock to till the fields. So obviously that has an impact on the uh, area your you, a family can farm and the kind of crop production that they can uh, undertake. Here's another picture. You can literally see the tail end of a donkey here. So in some cases you need to support your livestock so that you can get your other livestock to market or bring it home from market. So in terms of their role in transportation, uh, supporting your livestock is really critical to the variety of foods you can buy and bring home for your family. And livestock play an important role, again, with uh, transportation, but specifically in terms of energy poverty. So simply collecting uh, uh, fuel wood and bringing it home, for example, might require livestock and uh, without enough energy to, uh, for cooking purposes, for example, families aren't aren't gonna be able to cook the food that they need. And so how does this all link back to forests? So lastly, uh, this in the lower, uh, lower right here, silvo pastoral systems. So situations where people are grazing their livestock in the forest, provide shade, but also additional nutrients can also be uh, a really important a source of nutrition for the livestock, which are then able to provide these other services and provide meat and milk and other things. And so there's some really compelling work uh, from one of the, the places that we've worked in Ethiopia, showing that households that live closer to forests have more livestock, meaning they uh, have more livestock, healthier livestock, and they're better able to meet the nutritional needs of their livestock when they have access to forests which their livestock can graze into. So this, this role of forests in impacting diet diversity is quite, um, quite complex and it may not be, it's, it's often different than we might uh, immediately suspect. And here's uh, conveying those relationships in a uh, graphical format a bit. So again, starting with forests here, on the left and dietary diversity here on the right. There's some complex interactions where forests might provide fuel in terms of wood fuel for cooking. In addition, forests are providing feed to livestock, which then may provide uh, dung for cooking as well. Manure is also then from the livestock is used as a soil amendment. So that's also gonna affect crop productivity. So that's certainly gonna affect dietary diversity by influencing the type and productivity of crops that a household can, can grow. And then of course, there's the direct link where live, the, the products from livestock like meat, milk, and eggs play a really important role in supporting diet diversity as well. And so these are, these sort of indirect complicated ways that forests support diet diversity that may not be apparently obvious and weren't obvious to me until I started working more with the nutrition and the agronomy community to uncover these links. So let me just summarize a bit here and uh, add a couple new points. So forest cover 
to potentially improve, improve dietary diversity through a couple different ways. So first there's that direct route of just providing many different types of food items, ranging from bush meat to wild fruit, to uh, green leafy vegetables, honey, non-timber forest products. Forests also play an important role because they subsidize agriculture. And this could be by providing fodder for livestock that then can provide manure, milk, meat, and eggs. And what I'm not gonna talk about too much today is what we also know, forests subsidize agriculture through the wide range of ecosystem services such as pest control and pollination. And there's a wide variety of ecological studies on those types of benefits from forests. And lastly, I just want to say a couple more words about the important role of forests in reducing energy poverty. So uh, forests provide fuel wood, or they provide the fodder for livestock that uh, provide dung for cooking. But uh, what happens when households are limited in terms of uh, fuel for cooking, they may cook different foods, they may skip meals, and they may not cook as many of the nutrient dense foods like pulses or legumes that are quite uh, nutritiously dense, but take a long time to cook. And so households may cook less of those types of foods because they simply uh, don't have the uh, energy to support uh, those meals or those types of meals. So there's a lot of complex links here. So there's indirect, indirect and some pretty complex pathways that forests can support diet, diet diversity. So those are some of the mechanisms that we understand fairly well. What struck me as the more I worked with agronomists and uh, people in the nutrition community and talking about forest foods is I was really struck as a landscape ecologist with we know how much of the, the world is fragmented. So uh, Nick Haddad and others estimated that 70% of the world's remaining forests are less than one kilometer from an edge. And so that really struck me in, in, a, in many ways that in managing forests and in managing landscapes today, what we're really doing is managing edges. So we really need to think about the role of edges. And that got us thinking about how edges might uh, function in terms of diet diversity and food security. So there's a lot of things that we know from edges uh, about forest edges and their ecology, that there's going to be different species mix in terms of uh, the vegetation and then the wildlife that are at forest edges and there's going to be different microclimates and uh, in some cases uh, forest hedgerows along crops they may increase crop productivity or they may uh, decrease crop productivity so it can have different different effects and there can also be drawbacks such as these forest edges near farms might be a source of insect or wildlife pests so there's different roles that forest edges might play but let's think about the species mix at forest edges and the fact that edges of the forest are quite accessible. So here's one example uh, with Saba. Guava would be another good example. There's some quite nutritious uh, pioneer, often weedy species that do pretty well at forest edges, but they have some good nutritional value. So Saba is just an example of one of those sources of nutrition that grows at edges and can provide um, an important source of fruit for diets. So this got us thinking more about forest edge habitats and whether or not they functioned as a nutritional ecotone, right? So perhaps the nutrition at forest edges is different from what's in the interior of the forest and is obviously gonna be different than what's in uh, an agricultural field nearby. So. In some places, the green leafy vegetables are collected along forest edges. And so these are the super highly nutritious green leafy vegetables that we all know that we should uh, eat more of. Some of those are pioneer species that do well at edges. In some places, people are more likely to go into the forest interior 
when they're hunting or looking for mushrooms or some certain type of food. Whereas some of this collection at the edges might be a bit opportunistic. So they're traveling or they're traversing from one place to another and they're stopping to collect uh, some fruit at the forest edge as they go. Unfortunately, in some places as well, women will avoid forest interiors because uh, due to fear of assault and their safety. And so forest edges on more traveled routes are potentially more safe for them as a place to gather food or fuel or whatever it is they're, uh, whatever it is they're searching for. And lastly, it could be that forest edges are useful for nutrition because by their definition, they're likely to be smaller patches of forest dispersed throughout the landscape. So they just might be located in places that are easier to access because you don't have to go into the forest, but then they also might be dispersed throughout the landscape. So we thought maybe there was some real potential for forest edge habitats and small patches to function as a different type of source for nutrition. And this is just a, a, a fun zoom out of a landscape, a place we've worked in Ethiopia, where the green is the forest and these shades of gray show all the different edge habitats throughout this landscape that grade into agriculture. And so you can see if we're managing this landscape and we're thinking about multiple ecosystem services, including nutrition, we've got a lot of edge habitats to think about, not just uh, forest interiors and not, not just agricultural fields. And so it was kind of exciting for me as a landscape ecologist to realize that there's a real, uh, there's a real niche for our skills and our tools and our perspectives on forest fragmentation that might be quite valuable to thinking about food security. So one of my collaborators in this work, Bronwyn Powell, has presented a framework that looks like this. So this schematic helps us start thinking about the fact that uh, a diverse diet probably requires a diverse landscape because a lot of different foods might have a different ecological niche. So let's, uh, let's explore that a little bit more. So cereals and grains in gold here and in gold in the, in the schematic, you're gonna need some open fields if you want to produce that type of food on the landscape. For roots and tubers, plantains, those are often produced in fallow lands or agroforestry systems. So you'll need some of that type of uh, agro ecosystem on the landscape as well. A household or village that wants some nuts and pulses, you are going to need some open fields for that. As I mentioned before, meat and poultry production, uh, it can be quite challenging. And so often uh, livestock, keeping, livestock keeping is benefits quite a bit from having access to forest resources. So that can make life easier for uh, people who are tending li livestock. In terms of vegetable consumption, uh, uh, some of Bronwyn Powell's work has found that um, it's quite variable how much vegetable consumption uh, occurs in different countries, but also where it comes from. So in Burkina Faso, it, often it comes from trees and gardens and leaves of trees as well. In parts of East Africa, some of the vegetables that people eat are these uh, weedy wild plants that you might find in the margins of fields. And it's notable that uh, half of the fruit consumed globally comes from trees. So we, we've got to have some tree cover or scattered trees if you want to have fruit production. And then similarly, milk and uh, fish, other important sources of micronutrients are going to require different habitat types across the landscape. So uh, some of us, we were, we were grateful then to be uh, supported by Sasink to explore this question a little bit more with a working group that allowed us to put together a variety of different data sets useful in answering these kind of questions. So uh, this, the red circles represent the homesteads and the households. What we were able to do is 
get together some survey data with geolocated households. So we know exactly where the households are. And those surveys also included diet, uh, different a variety of diet information. And then we're able to link those diets to more specifics about the amount of forest, the type of forest, and the uh, fragmentation of that forest. And so that those are some of our goals for this project. I wanted to briefly, I don't wanna give her whole story away, but I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the fantastic work by the, one of the postdocs in our group, uh, Dr. Laura Vang Rasmussen, who's now an assistant professor. She uh, did a fantastic job with uh, enormous set of household survey data from five different countries. And she used the World Bank's uh, standard, Living Standard Measurement Survey, LSMS data for thousands of households in five African countries. And the, the, the most intriguing one of the most intriguing results of her work is that she found that diet diversity, sometimes the amount of forest mattered, but it always was higher when there was more forest patches. So the amount of forest didn't matter as much to driving diet diversity as uh, forest patches. And what she also was able to do with this data set is she was able to look at a sentinel food group. So fruit consumption, because we know it's one of the healthier food groups to consume, she was able to tease out the role of forests on fruit consumption. And she found in general, more forests led to more fruit consumption. But interestingly, uh, the increase in fruit consumption was also associated with uh, increasing number of forest patches. So this gives us some idea that the it's not just the amount of forests, but the, the spatial arrangement or the fragmentation or the dispersion of those uh, forests also might matter for uh, nutrition. And while we don't know the mechanism for this yet, um, it could be related to the fact that small forest patches are intentionally cultivated with uh, orchard species and fruit trees that are intentionally maintained. It could also be that they're easier to access when people are traveling through the landscape. And there's a variety of other uh, potential hypotheses that uh, one might wanna explore with that. So if you need another idea for a fantastic uh, visiting, uh, speaker, I highly would uh, recommend reach out to uh, Dr. Rasmussen. She is uh, does fantastic work and is uh, gives fantastic talks as well. Okay, so we've talked a fair bit about nutrition and forests. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about how we map forests because and some things that I think are important for us in the geospatial community to think about moving forward because I'm, me and many others are quite interested in uncovering these links between forest cover and nutrition. But the way that we map and monitor forests is kind of getting in the way <laughs> in a sense. It's lacking some really important information that we need to, to, uh, to really understand why we see these patterns. And some of that comes down to something as simple as what do we call forest and what do we call non-forest? So I just wanna share some of these ideas with you as we think about uh, those of us in the geospatial community, whether we're in, in using GIS or remote sensing or field work, thinking about some of these definitions and how they limit, limit the science in this area. So often the definitions of forests include a minimum patch size requirement. And of course, for functional reasons, this makes a lot of sense. Uh, so the FAO, for example, has a minimum patch size requirement of a half a hectare. So if a, if a forest patch is not at least half a hectare, we're not going to call it forests. And part of, part of these rules were developed so that we can do global forest monitoring and have consistent results across countries. So of course, the, these, these rules are needed. But what I'm saying is that they don't always help us tease apart these diet relationships. So we need to do a little bit more. So in the case of these minimum patch size requirements, 
not only do we miss uh, sacred forest patches, which can be quite small, and Robin Ch Chasden has done uh, tons of work exploring their importance, I want to talk a little bit about home gardens, which would be missed with this type of monitoring. And I don't know if you can see on this map, but you can see these smaller blue patches of forest. These are home gardens in Ethiopia that uh, I'm very grateful that one of the students in my lab was able to manually map these by hand using Google Earth because they're too small to be detected uh, um, in an automated fashion using other ways. So we had to map them by hand, but let me tell you why we did that because they're so important. So home gardens, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time here. So home gardens are kind of what they sound like. It's a small garden that's usually close to the home with cultivated species. Home gardens often have a bit of canopy structure, right? So there's, there may be an overstory species and then there's gonna be a wide diversity of understory species that can grow in this environment. And so a home garden often has a different microclimate than the rest of the landscape. So there may be things that can grow in the home garden that can't grow elsewhere in the landscape. And we know, so globally, we know that micronutrients from home gardens are super important for the nutrition for women and children. So that's, that's something we see in a lot of different places. We also know that these home gardens are really important for food security reasons because they can be really important during the lean season, right? So perhaps uh, there's a crop failure or you're in between the harvest of two uh, crops in the field. So these lean, these lean times, home gardens can be really important for food security during those lean times. What we're looking at here is, uh, it, this is an NSET home garden. So that's what I showed you mapped on the previous slide. So NSET is also called false banana. It does not actually produce bananas, but it might look a bit uh, banana-esque. And NSET home gardens are, again, really important for some of the reasons I just suggested, the source of micronutrients, NSET is very drought tolerant, so it does well even when other when crops are failing and, and uh, periods of drought, uh, NSET can do really well. It does have this microclimate that is supports a wide variety of uh, species and varieties that can't grow elsewhere in the landscape. However, it does require large nutrient additions. So what's interesting about these NSET home gardens in uh, Aromia in Ethiopia is people living near forests do a better job of maintaining their home gardens because being near a forest means they can better maintain their livestock, which means they have more access to manure, which is definitely needed to support the rich soils of these home gardens. So, Fam uh, households that live far away from forests and don't have access to forests have trouble maintaining their home gardens and in fact have less home gardens than communities living closer to forests. And so that's a very kind of distal effect that we may not uh, necessarily have seen. So another limitation of forest monitoring as I see it is our minimum cover thresholds, meaning depending on what threshold we use, we're potentially missing some important trees or scattered trees or moderate levels of forest cover. So, so for example, some monitoring, uh, some definitions in forest monitoring say that you need to have a minimum of 30% tree cover to be called forest and below that your non-forest, or maybe the threshold's 10%, it depends whose um, criteria that you use. But Zomer and others estimated that over 40% of agriculture lands globally have some component of agroforestry on them. And so they actually have more than 10% tree cover. So how are we classifying those lands and what sorts of nutritional benefits do those lands provide? That's a real area of concern from a mapping perspective, but also just from on the ground, understanding the role that scattered trees play on the landscape 
And usually they're quite underestimated. So usually we're not doing a good enough job mapping these scattered trees in a variety of situations. And lastly, um, just in a, in a plug for uh, multidisciplinary work, these scattered trees are often referred to with an acronym TOF, which are trees outside of forests if you're a forester, but if you're if you if you're in the agricultural disciplines, you call them trees on farms. So uh, it's an active area of research and definitely needs more uh, integration and collaboration between uh, those of us who map and those of us who study forests and study agriculture. And just uh, just to kind of uh, drive home this point a bit, um, I mentioned how important trees are to uh, producing the world's fruit globally really important source of vitamin A and millions of deaths per year are attributed to a lack of fruits and vegetables because they're so healthy for us. And one, uh, one study in many low and middle income countries found that uh, almost 80% of people were failing to meet their recommended uh, minimum intake for fruit. So uh, mapping scatter trees, fruit trees, even if they're not a forest by our ecological standards, are super important. And lastly, let's see how I'm doing on time here. So an just another brief example that I'd like to share is sometimes the way that we classify forests doesn't help in terms of understanding their nutritional value. So I'll talk about the second bullet point here. So the, the amazing global forest data set that Matt Hansen and, uh, led the development of, it's an amazing data set. And uh, we're, it's, it's fantastic that we have access to it. Unfortunately for nutrition and food security questions, oil palm plantations, for example, are classified as, as forest cover. In, in that type of monitoring, right? And oil palm plantations from a nutritional standpoint aren't necessarily gonna provide much in terms of nutritional, uh, nutritional diversity to households. And in fact, it's, it's actually a real problem in parts of Indonesia where the cash income that households receive from oil palm is sometimes used to buy less uh, nutritional foods at the market. So highly processed foods, uh, uh, noodles and things with a, not a lot of nutritional value. So in some cases, uh, certain types of what we would call forest uh, actually are associated with a lower dietary diversity and nutritional value for, for households. So there's, there's certain kinds of monocultures and plantations that we uh, struggle to map in some of these these global forest monitoring situations because uh, they're classified in a way that doesn't really help us. So just real briefly, I think some of the knowledge gaps can be filled by more use of high spatial resolution imagery and it's fantastic. You can watch your Sentinel cover much of the earth in about five days, Sentinel two. So that's pretty exciting. Also, things that are important that need more research uh, involve seasonal forest phenology. So the diet diversity of households often changes throughout the course of the season. And some of that has to do with the, the fruiting phenology and uh, the leafing, uh, leaf on and leaf off of trees. And so that contribution to nutrition is uh, definitely an interesting uh, angle. And of course, historical forest change, whether primary forests or secondary forests are being used as a source of nutrition is an active area that needs more research. So part of what our succinct working group came up with to help guide research in this area is just basically kind of a, a conceptual framework that helps us break apart a multitude of ways that a landscape, in terms of its composition and its configuration, might impact diet diversity and different aspects of diets. And so I've talked about most of these already. So this first pathway is this direct pathway by which forests 
provide food and non-timber forest products that help support diet diversity. The agroecological pathway or some of the ecosystem services pathway is another way that landscapes feed into providing diet diversity to households. I talked a bit about the energy pathway. So that's shown in orange here. So the fuel, household fuel available, whether it comes from uh, livestock or from the forest, that's gonna have a big impact in terms of the, the foods that a household is able to consume. And lastly, I kind of alluded to this fourth pathway just a little bit. So we, we call this the income pathway and that's the, the income, the cash sources that a, that a household might get. Maybe it's from selling forest products or maybe it's from selling agricultural products or maybe it's from employment elsewhere. But there's, it's, really, it's really not a given that more household income is going to lead to better nutrition. So in some cases it does because households are able to access and purchase a more, a greater diversity of foods from local markets. However, sometimes it results in households buying less nutritious foods and high, high fat and sugar and oil and highly processed foods from markets. So the role of income in supporting diet diversity is it's not a catch-all solution and it won't necessarily lead to healthier diets. So just to summarize here, uh, forests have been called the supermarket of the wild. And I think landscapes are also the, the supermarkets of the wild as well, kind of complex supermarkets because they are full of direct and indirect roles in supporting diet diversity and food security and energy poverty. And I think it's a real problem that our current approaches to mapping and classifying forests, they're not quite catching the things, the attributes of forests that are necessarily the most relevant to nutrition. So there's a big wide open area of research there, just improving forest monitoring for the standpoint of food security and nutrition. And so I'll just close with uh, some of the things that I think are uh, important moving forward and hopefully some positive synergies in the face of the massive changes that we're seeing worldwide. So forest loss, unfortunately, might have impacts on nutrition. So of course, forest loss also impacts human health uh, more broadly. Uh, zoonotic pandemics that we're currently in are uh, no exception. So forest loss has a wide variety of impacts potentially on human health. Uh, one of those is potentially gonna be nutrition. And I think it's important that we uh, stop always thinking about the interplay between forests and agriculture as making a trade-off about food or trade-off of uh, regarding food security or nutrition. It's not always, um, it, it's not always that forest protection is necessarily going to reduce the food or nutrition available. And so I think it's, it's kind of that oversimplification of agriculture forest interactions has kind of led us to focus on things like land sharing and land sparing as, as being, as representing this, this, that it's only a trade-off between agriculture and forests. And I think there's a lot more, uh, a lot more interactions going on there that can't just be simplified down to the land sharing and sparing debate. I also think that uh, forest restoration policy, there's international agreements to uh, restore hundreds of millions of hectares of forests. And it's a great opportunity. We need to think about that opportunity, not just in terms of carbon, but we also need to think about that opportunity in terms of nutrition and what the nutritional implications of that are. And at the same time, uh, the UN has also declared uh, recently the decade of action on nutrition where federal, national governments are making concerted efforts to improve the nutrition of their populations. And the 
uh, nutrition community is, is, is increasingly thinking more about the sustainability of nutrition and where it comes from. And I think uh, the, the, the role of forests in nutrition have generally been left out of that conversation until quite recently. So there needs to be more of a conversation between nutrition, the nutrition community and the forest restoration community. And lastly, I think just in terms of the benefits of high resolution landscape monitoring that I'm suggesting is needed. It's, you know, doing this type of monitoring for nutrition and food security will also have knock on effects for conservation planning and poverty alleviation, because often these issues coincide in certain parts of the world where we're fighting all these, we're uh, trying to solve all these problems at once. And so I think um, the geospatial community has an important role to play moving forward in really understanding all the ways that landscapes impact uh, human health and well-being. And lastly, I'd just like to thank the many institutions that uh, helped fund this work and provided, especially succinct, that provided a fantastic intellectual environment to do this work, as well as uh, other institutions that have supported me on sabbatical and provided funding for this work. And with that, I think I'll end it there. And uh, thank you again for sharing the last 40 or 45 minutes with me. And I am happy to answer your questions. And if we don't get to talk today and I don't get to your questions today, feel free to drop me an email or check out our work on my website, or you can also find me on Twitter. So thanks to each and every one of you for being here today. Thank you so much, Sarah, for um, a fantastic talk. Really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, so we have 13 minutes for questions. Um, and then I think Sarah will be uh, for at least for some time available during the forum. Um, so you can feel free to type your question into the chat. I, I'll read it out loud. Um, you're welcome to just speak. Um, or if um, we get a lot of questions. You could uh, also raise your hand. Well, maybe I'll just get us started because <laughs> what I was thinking is sure. so you. You've outlined the, you know, these different pathways and management needs, which, you know, all all lend themselves to like a whole host of research questions. So, um, what's specifically next for you and your group um, in terms of research? Yeah. So, well, we we spent a fair amount of time getting some of these pretty massive data sets together and trying to make them co coincide for certain locations. Uh, yeah, anyway, it's been sort of a data management nightmare. So uh, thankfully, the next step is to do some of the actual nuts and bolts analyses where we can tease out these different pathways with different forest cover data sets that we're doing our best to kind of find, find the sweet spot between forest cover data sets that are consistent and similar everywhere versus mm -hmm. highly classifying them in more detail for the, for the places that we're working. And so, um, as I mentioned, uh, one of the locations working in Indonesia, it's really important to tease out the uh, oil palm plantations and not just call them forest. In, in uh, Bangladesh, we have a site where Distinguishing the teak plantations uh, has been a real challenge, and of course, is is really important to understanding what the potential food security role of those forests are. So, yeah, it's kind of that combination of uh, just starting with the spatial data analysis next to figure out, you know, what are some kind of universal forest cover measures that are useful and how do we adapt them to local sites?
sounds like you have data to keep you busy for the next decade. Yeah. <laughs> Sarah, I have a question for you. Sure. Yeah, thanks for a really insightful talk. Uh, fascinating topics that seem so understudied. Um, one question I had from the um, analytical side of things, did you find it challenging to match the spatial scale of like the forest drivers, like the, the forest characteristics you were measuring and the dietary consumption data? Yeah, that's, that's kind of been the, the holy grail at the moment. So that first study that I talked about at the beginning of my talk, that was using MODIS imagery. And so there's, tons of forest cover that was, wouldn't even be represented using MODIS, right? Tons of small mm -hmm. that are missing. Uh, and then when our working group, we were able to use Hansen's Landsat data. So that added another level of more refined information. But even there, we found that uh, uh, Laura Rasmussen's work that I mentioned, uh, Northern Nigeria, has a bunch of forests, but it was showing up as completely non-forested in the handset in the Hansen data set. So we kind of had to drop some areas, which we knew were just simply not well represented by the data at hand. So there's it's just this yeah, so, to well, drill down example, to I, yeah. if you had, for example, if you had a um, you know, you have a pixel from the imagery. MODIS, Landsat, whatever it is, and then you have like data from some jurisdictional area or a village. How do you mm. kind of like match like the pixel or is it like a group of pixels that are averaged? Well, so some of the survey data that we use, we have a geolocated household, so we know exactly mm -hmm. where that is. Some of those survey data sets have information from a cluster, and that cluster is um, jiggered, I guess, to protect anonymity. So you know where generally where that cluster is. So what we've been doing is looking at forest cover within either a five or 10 kilometer radius of households or of clusters, depending on the, the survey data that we're looking okay. at and trying to figure out if the relationships are different at those scales. And usually they're not. Um, it, it's hard to generalize about how far people go for forest resources because it, de you know, depending on the resource, they'll travel all day and some things are that people will only go nearby. So we've kind of stuck to the realm of the surrounding two kilometers to 10 kilometers for the types of rural communities that we're addressing. That's been about the range that we think mm. would be most fruitful. Yeah, interesting. It's like, at what spatial scale does forest matter? <laughs> yeah, cool, thanks. We have time for um, a few more questions, if there are any. All right, well, um, then please join me again in thanking Sarah um, for, for joining us today, for sharing this important work. Um, I really appreciate um, you taking the time during <laughs> a very, I mean, it's a, it's a busy time. <laughs> so I really appreciate you joining us. Um, John's just posted the link in the chat to um, the forum that's starting at 4.30. Um, so I'll give, um, Sarah and the rest of us a little chance to take a break um, and hopefully um, you'll be able to join the forum um, starting at 430. Right. Thank you all. Take care. Yeah, thank, thanks so much, Sarah. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> thanks for hosting, Yelena. My pleasure. Sorry if I stole your forum, uh, social thunder. <laughs> nope. <laughs> it's perfect. Thank you. Okay, good. Are you also able to email me that link? Yes. Okay. Do that now. Yep. All right. Thanks, everyone. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks. Take take care.